Let him let me talk to him. Because uh, I, I heard that. He might be transferring in spring. So I was like, well, oh, good for him. All right. Hey, let me get us started. It's, it is past time and continuing on. Um, I trust that uh, you've been working hard on 31 and continuing on. Um, today's lesson is the next step, chapter 32, which I, I know you're still reading the textbook before you come to class. Why? You haven't fallen behind on any of that good stuff. Good. Um, but it does, it does help. But today, uh, you will see, if you didn't already in the reading here, that this chapter, it's one of those what I call the engineering chapters. We're going back to our circuits again. Uh, we're going to take the physics that we just learned and apply it to our circuitry. And so, just like we did earlier on with our electricity, we learned about electric fields and potentials and resistance. And from that, we put it all together and we started building circuits. And we looked at things that were series and parallels, the advantages, the disadvantages of all of those. Then we looked at capacitors and how those fit into the circuit. And we're about to do the same thing now. Now we're going to look at Faraday's law and how does Faraday's law fit into the circuit. So let me start there. The fancy word, if you will, is called induction and or inductance. And so chapter 32, the title of this is inductance. What is inductance? And we could put this into two categories. There could be a self-inductance. And that's really what we're going to spend the majority of the time. The author kind of alludes to a mutual inductance, since they are the same physical principles of Faraday's law. But mutual inductance is a little more involved in terms of our circuitry. And the truth is, he just kind of introduces it kind of gets you ready and says, oh, wait until you take your circuits class. For those of you who are taking a circuits class, then we'll talk about mutual in inductance. And even then, I would uh, suspect that maybe even your first circuits class might kind of stand back from it and say, well, let's just do self-inductance first, and then the next semester we'll do mutual inductance. And so, as I want to get across to you today is what is self-inductance. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, there's no new physical principle here. So in terms of me lecturing, it's pretty easy for me. It's just, okay, I'm just going to show you Faraday's law again. In fact, that's how I want to begin inductance. I want to begin inductance by writing the EMF is minus the negative of, or minus the, the number of turns times the change in flux. That was the physical principle discovered by Faraday and that we just win a bunch of examples and I'm sure you're still kind of working along there. But let's take a look at a solenoid again or a coil or however you want to de define this but if I take then a solenoid okay, and for you guys for illustration purposes I'll start with say this one here here's a big one that I can hold up in, in front of you truth is most of these are actually pretty small when they're put into the circuit and so I'll pass this beaker around that's got a lot of in inductors. So one of my favorite ones is actually out of an old radio here and some tuning here. But I like this one because you can quickly see it. But look at some of these other ones as I pass them around and you will see the thin wire wrapped around a metal core here. And so you can see it has something to do with inductance here. And I didn't bring a metal core. Probably should have. Oh, well, I guess I do have. I can use this. But if I were to take this and wrap it around, in this case, there's 440 turns. Or halfway, 220, depending on how you want to hold it. But anyway, I'll just say there's 440 here. Okay? And I wrap it around here. This is my solenoid. And of course, when you pass current through here, there's going to create a magnetic field. Fair enough? 
And of course, we haven't done too much with materials in here, but this would make the field a little bit stronger, as you saw when we did the uh, electromagnet. And so I could increase the strength of the field by putting a core in there. And those real ones, you'll see, you'll actually have a core. So they don't have as many wires wrapped around. They just have a few wires and then a core. For us, we'll just do without the core and then have a lot of wires. But to extend on to Faraday's law, let me do this. Let me take the core, uh, whether the core is filled with iron or just air, and that's really the discussion I want to have here today. Here's my core, so we'll call this an air-filled solenoid. And I take some wire and I wrap it and I'll go behind it and then over the top and then behind it and over the top and down in front, behind it, over the top, down in front. And so here is my coil. Here is my solenoid. And of course, what we've been learning for the last couple chapters here, going I guess back two chapters, if there's a current, there's going to create a magnetic field. If the current is changing with time, that means the flux that is in here is changing and that's going to produce an EMF. Let me take what I would call an end view of this. And so I look at just the circular part here, looking into this air coil. So I take this and I look straight in. And the wires would be going up and around and around and around and then down, something like that. And of course, I could make the current go one way and or the other way. I could have the change in current the same direction or decreasing. So if I have it increasing, then the change in current is in one direction. But Here's what I want to take a look at. Let's look inside this coil for a moment. Let's take, again, what you're just finishing up here, Faraday's Law, and say, let's look at the inside of this coil for just a second, right in here somewhere. Uh, if I grab a, a different color, maybe I could say, let's look, and I'll put a little X for maybe the center here, and I'll say, let's take a look at a circle right somewhere inside the solenoid. And here's the point I'm getting at. Is, would there be an EMF created here? Well, let's come back here to Faraday's Law. Faraday's Law says an EMF is produced if what? change in flux. And I should say magnetic flux. So I'll put a little B there. So when there is a change in flux, then there is an EMF. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, would there be any flux through there? Okay, so the flux would come from the current that is, or I say, should say it this way, the flux would come from the magnetic field that is set up from the solenoid. The magnetic field is coming from the current. So it comes all the way back to this current. So if we just had a steady current, say the current was 5 amps, and it didn't change, well, the 5 amps would produce a magnetic field. It would produce a flux. Fair enough? But would it be changing? No, not if it was a steady 5 amps. So I would say, with a steady 5 amps, I would get no EMF on the inside of this solenoid. In fact, the only time I'd get an EMF is if there is a change in flux. And that flux could come from the change in the current. So if the current is increasing or decreasing, then I would have an EMF. Fair enough? Let's do some quick math before we really kind of get started into this chapter. Let's do last chapter here for just a second. Let's apply Faraday's Law to this scenario. And since I started in blue, maybe I'll keep doing the equation in blue, but this says there is an EMF. An EMF is produced by the number of turns, and let me just put magnitude, I'm not even going to worry about the, the, the minus sign there, but it would be the number of turns. Now, the number of turns where? Okay, so I'm trying to find the EMF in this loop. 
Okay? And so it would be how many loops I have. It could be just one, but let me leave the end there because I could have more than one. Fair enough? This is what we were referring to last time as the secondary effect. Not to be confused with the number of turns that are in the primary. So, to help your visual effect, let me grab this one here. Uh, probably shouldn't take too much apart because I've got to put it back together here. But I'll go ahead and say, let's say this is the secondary. Now, this has 180 turns. But if I were to place that inside, my question would be, do I get an EMF in here? And I would say, well, yeah, an EMF is if you have a change in current here in your primary. So if the primary is changing its current, and since the current is related to the magnetic field, then there would be a changing magnetic field. That changing magnetic field would produce an EMF in here. Okay. And so I'll just refer to this as the secondary. Whereas the flux itself is coming from the solenoid. And that's what I will call the primary. So how do you calculate the flux going through this secondary, which is coming from the primary? Okay, good. And so there's n number in the secondaries. There is the derivative. Yeah, and you pointed out what makes this a fairly simple calculation is the b has the same value inside a solenoid. That's why I decided to grab the solenoid. Uh, then I would have the area of the solenoid and then I would have an angle of 0 degrees or 180 degrees um, and so either a plus 1 or a minus 1 but again not really paying attention to the pluses and minuses because I can figure that out with Lenz's law in my right hand. I would have an equation so far that says this. The EMF produced in my secondary um, is the number of turns I have in my secondary times the derivative of and so here brings up a question. What's changing up here? Yeah, and B is connected to the magnetic, or B is the magnetic field, and it's connected to how much current is in my solenoid. And so if you remember from back to chapter 30, there is the equation uh, we got from Ampere's law that said how much magnetic field is created inside that solenoid. And so that's our part that if current is changing, then the B field is, is changing. Uh, how about area? What's area? Okay, now maybe I should label this. I will label a capital R as the radius of the solenoid that the current is traveling in here, what I'll call the primary. And I'll call little r then the radius of this little coil that's inside, the secondary. Okay, and so I want the area of Pi, do I want little r squared or big r squared? Right, it's going to be the little r because again, coming back here, this is the EMF produced. The EMF is what is produced in the flux through the secondary. And in this case, the secondary is a little bit smaller than the whole primary. And so I will put an r squared. All right. Well, let me keep going with this. Uh, here is N for the secondary. Good. Here is a mu naught. I will pull that out in front of the derivative. What was this little N again? Number of turns in which one? What I'll call the primary, exactly. So if I take this apart here, you're talking about the field being produced by this. So the first N we talked about here, the secondary, this is the, the EMF produced in the secondary. That's why this N represents how many turns do you have to your secondary. So in this case it's 180. But now, the other N is what's creating the field. This is the number of turns in the primary. So I'm going to write this as N of primary divided by, and let's put a number up here. Let's call this the length 
of the solenoid. And so I'll put a little L there, but that's what that little N is. The current is then the, you know, perhaps changing. As we said earlier, if it wasn't changing, well, then our discussion is kind of boring because without a change in current, we don't have a change in flux and we don't have an EMF. All we have is a solenoid with current, which makes a magnetic field, which is a great conversation, but that's two weeks ago stuff. That's chapter 30, right? And, and so now we're looking at what happens with the change effect. Um, I'll keep going here and put in, and maybe I, just for making things a little simpler, I will put it forward and then write the derivative of the current. Okay, so it sounds like that much makes sense to you so far. Same thing, same thing we've done. I haven't done anything new right. This is, this is Faraday's law. All right. Here's where it becomes interesting. What if we stop for a moment imagining the secondary in here? What if I just remove the secondary and say, what about the coil itself? Is there an EMF produced in the coil itself, from the coil itself? Hence the name self induct. You see, I would call this much of it just inductance. The, what I have done so far is to say that if I took a primary coil and put a second one inside, then the change in current in the primary then induces a voltage in the secondary. But what I want you to see is we could take that a little bit further. If I think of the secondary as being this coil itself and ask the question, I am trying to shove more current into this primary, what's going to happen? The primary itself will create an EMF and create what we're going to call a back voltage and say, don't come in here. And so as I try to put more current in here, that changes the flux, that produces a voltage, and this is opposing more current as I try to put more current in it. Well, let me see if a, if a, a picture kind of makes sense here. Here is how I would describe this with a circuit. I would say, all right, let's take a battery with a switch. Let me connect it to this primary, this solenoid, what we're soon going to call an inductor. And what I'm going to do is take those wires and just like we had over there, Maybe I'll do something like this. Uh, maybe I'll even add a resistor here just so that I can control whether I want a little bit of current or whether I want a lot of current. Or maybe I'll just put an R there to represent the fact that if I have a bunch of wires, all those wires have resistance. And so by the time you take all this long wire, 440 turns, you got to get some credit for resistance somewhere in here. These wires are pretty long. And so maybe I'll just use the R for that. But the point is, somewhere out here, there is both a resistance and, here's the new piece, an inductor. And the point I'm trying to get here is, if you try to send current through here, that is, when I first close the switch, what's going to happen is current starts to flow. What I want you to see is as current starts to flow, there is a change in the current. The change in, concur in current would produce a, an EMF, what we're going to call a back EMF. It's going to oppose the change. And as you try to put current in, that little device, which we will now call an inductor, says, whoa, 
Stop. <laughs> and you can think of it this way. You can think of this circuit, at least at that moment, as here is my power supply, here is my switch, and here then is a back EMF. And you would not have gotten as much current as you would have thought. In fact, I'm kind of thinking that many of you, before you walked into class today, probably would have thought that if I close this switch, then I would have a voltage and a resistor, and the current would just simply be V over R, because the rest of this is just some wire. Maybe it has a little resistance, but if we account for that, or we say the wire's fat and doesn't have much resistance, I'm sure you would have just thought off the top of your head, oh, the current is V over R. No. Much more interesting and much more complicated is because what I'm going to have then is current as a function of time. What I would kind of expect to see now that I understand Faraday's law is that when I first close this switch, closing that switch is going to start forcing current to go into this primary, this inductor. That inductor, because of Faraday's law, will produce a back EMF. And so the voltage or the current that is produced at that moment would really be the voltage from my power supply minus the EMF divided by my resistor. And that's the new piece of the puzzle, and that's where I want to start today, is to realize here that when you add a coil, solenoid, choke, inductor, whatever word you want to put in there, when you add this to the circuit, when you start to change the circuit, you first turn it on or you first turn it off, or you put an AC current in it. The consequence of that is that the current will change. And the consequence of a changing current is a changing magnetic field. And a changing magnetic field is a EMF. And so analyzing our circuit with a coil, solenoid, choke, inductor, whatever word you want to put there, it all comes down to Faraday's law and it gets a bit more complicated than this. And that's what the chapter is all about. So no new piece of physics other than saying what would happen if this field that we were talking about is actually applied on itself. And so if I come over here I could say for self-inductance the number of turns in the primary and the secondary are the same. There's not two coils here, right? The, the induced field is in here. It's created from here and induced in here. And so the magnetic field from the primary is then the same as the number of turns induced in the coil itself. Also, what would you say about little r? It's the same as big R. And so this does simplify to being a mu naught, an n squared. Your author likes to write it as a for area. So I'll go back to just a for area instead of the pi r squared. Divided by L d i d t. And that would be the magnitude of the E m f. Big R is the radius of this guy. Oh, and so it doesn't really matter. It is, it is um, infinite solenoid. Um. In, so R, big R is really applying in the infinite solenoid. Well, yeah, the infinite solenoid comes in right in this step because here I said this is the equation for the magnetic field, which was only valid for an infinitely tight wound solenoid. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, but keep going. Into my okay. All right. All right. All right. So 
so before I get into too many fancy words of electronics, I wanted just to pause here and make sure everybody saw the physics. The physics is Faraday's law. Faraday's law applied to a solenoid having an effect on itself is what we're going to call inductance. This, whoops, I erased it, but self-inductance. Okay, and in fact, for better or worse, we will often then bring back the negative sign. I think that's for good. Unfortunately, what I don't like is we bury all the neat Faraday's law stuff into one simple term and kind of forgets about Faraday's law and I want to keep emphasizing don't forget about Faraday's law but this then is what we call the value or the symbol of the inductance and so we are going to use the symbol capital L for inductance and what that simply means then is if we apply Faraday's law to a circuit and in this case the circuit is a solenoid but this could have been done with a toroid fair enough this could have been done with any shape right could have been a coaxial cable and I think your homework has you working with a toroid and a coaxial cable. I'm starting the lecture with a solenoid and saying, look, if you try to pass current through some kind of wires, those wires are going to make a magnetic field. If the current is changing, then that magnetic field is changing. And if that magnetic field is changing, Faraday's law is going to produce an EMF, a back EMF. And so we are going to write our circuitry like this. And so probably the most important equation for the chapter is right there. The EMF produced. And what I mean by that is the EMF within the circuit itself. And so you build a circuit. And when you build this circuit, as you tap this switch, as you turn it on, the current will change. And as you change, you don't get something as simple as this. You get something a bit more complicated like this. And better still, it's time dependent. Because look closely at this. Let's come back to here. When we kind of look at this, we would stand over here and say, okay, here's my inductor. Now, granted, the value of this inductance really depends on how many turns you have, what is the area, what is the length, but if we bury all that into one number, the conceptual idea is you get a back EMF for every time you change the current. And then if you take this one step further back to the next chapter, you would realize why you have an inductance. You have an inductance because it's based on the number of turns. It's based on the size of the solenoid. It's based on the length of the uh, solenoid. I suspect that many of you in circuits have already seen this. Fair enough? What I also suspect if you guys in circuits don't do that step. And it unfortunately kind of comes with mystery. Where did this this come from. So let's spend a little time and talk about the inductance here, but this I think is a good place to start. The inductance comes from Faraday's law. There is a back EMF and I even hopefully got some equipment that I can show you the back EMF. But again, let's just keep talking about this because again, there's no new principle here. It's just Faraday's law applied to a circuit. Let's see what happens when we do that. And you're beginning to see that consequence already. The first thing we notice then is we don't get something as simple as the current just turns on. What do we get? And so when you first close the switch, the back EMF will actually be exactly equal to the voltage coming from your power supply. And so again, when you first close that switch, you're trying to shove so much current into this solenoid, this inductor, that you will get a back EMF that is exactly equal to the power supply. So how much current will you get right then? Zero. And so on this graph, I will start with a current of zero. Again, it's not as simple as you might have first suspected here. It's not like, okay, no current, no current, no current. Ah, oh, close switch. Current, current, 
Turn it. No. What is it? Well, linear slope. it's not even linear. But I'm glad you asked because we will find it. But we will start here and say, well, at first the current is zero. Let's keep talking about it conceptually. So when you first close the switch, the current is zero. After a fraction of a second, and this could be a millionth of a second. Uh, I got some good numbers this morning when I was playing at one millionth of a second. So we'll see here. A millionth of a second, I'll get what? Well, yeah, please remember that in order to even have an EMF here, doesn't that mean you have to be in the process of changing the current? So that means the current may be zero at that moment, but at the same time it must have a slope. It must be in the process of increasing. Exactly. And so, yes, you close the switch right here. There will be a back EMF. We could even label it as plus here and minus there. Kind of what that picture is trying to show. But in order to have a plus and minus, you have to have a current increasing. Ah, now what does that mean? If the current is increasing, then the resistance, I said that wrong, not the resistance. If the current is then increasing, then I guess in my graph it looks something like, like this. Since the voltage here and here have to add up to the voltage here. And let's just say 6 volts, because that's what I was kind of playing with this morning. So I think I've still got my 6 volt power supply. We'll turn it on in a few moments. But if I call this 6 volts, and now we have current, then let's say there's enough current to say represent 1 volt here. What would that say about the back EMF there? It's only 5 volts. Now, coming back over to here, if our back EMF is only 5 volts, doesn't that mean the rate of change of current is something different than it was before? And it would be less. Ah, so this slope would not continue with the same value, but it would now have a different slope. You see, at first, it had to have enough slope because we had zero current. So that this was 6 volts, this was 0 volts, so that these two added up to 6 volts. That's why we had a slope. But a moment later, now that we have current, this is 1 volt, so this is only 5 volts, which would be a lower slope. And again, it would have to be increasing its current. So that means we would have more current. And if we had more current, what would that mean another millionth of a second later? Well, it means this might be at 2 volts. Now, if this is at 2 volts, what might this be? 4 volts, right? If that must be at 4, then the way you get less voltage is with less slope. And so what I expect here is to see something that is changing the current with time, but not a constant slope, one that's kind of arcing over a little bit. And since it's occurring naturally, I kind of expect a natural exponential function, but let's see if that works out. But I definitely don't expect a, a, a constant slope. And I do kind of expect this, that after a long period of time, what would you kind of expect after this has been hooked up and my definition of a long period of a time is a hundred millionths of a second. Okay, so, so a tenth of a millisecond later. Yeah, eventually I would expect the current to get high enough so that this is six volts. And if that's six volts, what lets this be? Zero. Zero. Now to get zero volts on this inductor, this choke, what would that say about the change in current? Zero. So it's reached a steady current. And so I would expect after a period of time for the current to be equal to that 6 volts over R. I expect it to be the V over R. I kind of expect it to be what I would have gotten had I not even thought about Faraday's law and the in inductor. And so there is a transition, if you will. It doesn't just go from no current up to its maximum. It starts at no current and increases up over a period of time and then labels off or steady state so that 
There is no change in current. There is no EMF. I can get rid of the plus and minus. I can get rid of the battery. And all I have is a 6 volt battery and a resistor. And that's the current I would expect. But that transition zone is what this chapter is all about. That discussion of what would happen if the current was being turned on or turning off. Or in the next couple of chapters, what if it was an AC current so that it was constantly going on and off and on and off. What would I expect to get? Yes. Um, well, so would this be a, so using this would be possible to use this to round out the humps in those uh, in the fridge by um, alternating current? Yeah, sure. What would it possibly be better for that? Um, you could do both, and as you'll see, inductors and capacitors are going to have a similar behavior. Um, but kind of opposite. So depending on what equipment and tools you have, you would say, hey, this is better to do it with an inductor or better to do it with a, a capacitor. And uh, you'll see that in, in just a second. But like I said, this is where I wanted to begin the lesson here. Saying, hey, get you a feel for inductance. No new physics, but certainly in a very important and powerful and conceptual application because it's so easy to miss what is making the voltage in the inductor. And so let me say it again. It is Faraday's law here. So let's take a little closer look at this. Oh, question. Um, can you ever get the EMF um, to exceed the voltage originally put through it? Like uh, yes, not in something this simple. Um, and let me hold off with some examples, but yeah, we're going to use the uh, inductor to change 4 volts. No, I think it's 12 volts on a homework problem you have. You have 12 volts like a car battery, and you use an inductor, and if you have another resistor and a few other things, we can get thousands of volts out of this. And yeah, yeah. Because again, the voltage is related to the change in current, and so how you, you have it. In fact, as long as you bring it up, I'll give you a conceptual one before we have the numbers. Anybody ha ever um, have like a, oh, a vacuum cleaner would be a good example, but some electrical motor where instead of turning it off, you unplug it. Or maybe you plug it in. You ever see sparks fly? That could be thousands of volts. Because as you go to turn on the motor, if you remember a couple chapters ago, the electricity goes through a coil which makes the magnetic field. And it's the interaction of the magnetic field that then makes the, the motor. And you might remember the little Flintstone motor we built. So if you have a motor running, that means the current is actually going through a solenoid. Now, you're not really, and the engineers haven't really designed it to think of it as an inductor, but the fact is it is still an inductor. And so if you try to stop the current right away, what does this say? If di dt is very, very big, what's this going to say about the voltage it induces? It can be very, very large. It's so much so that it can flow through the air. And so you think you're just going to unplug it and disconnect it. Meanwhile, you go to unplug it and it jumps that gap. It creates a voltage of maybe 10,000 volts and it makes that little spark across the air like we did with the Vandy graph way back at the beginning of this semester. And so there, there's a good conceptual example. So what is technically really causing to push the current backwards? Backwards. Okay. There is a voltage, an electric field, where does it come from? Ah, Don't forget this. If you can, like I said, if you can leave here and you'll know at least this much, especially you going into mechanical engineer and when you work with the electrical engineer, you can say, I remember that there are two ways to make an electric field. What are they? Charges. And so we have charges in this battery. And so what is making the current go this way are the charges in this battery. The electric field produced by the charges in the battery push the current this way. Your question is, what's pushing it that way? Well, what's the second way of making an electric field? A changing 
magnetic field or a changing flux. And so what is actually pushing it back is an electric field. It is the second type of an electric field. It is not an electric field created from charges. There aren't any charges in here. The charges are in the battery making an electric field push that way. This second EMF, if I can go back here, is the EMF produced because of the changing magnetic field. Does that help? Last week, I took a coil. Now, I had a bigger coil. It had 3,400 turns. It was a little bigger inside, but I hooked it to an, an ammeter up here, if you remember that needle. And what I did is I took a magnet in my hand and I shoved it in there and that needle moved. And that's really, you're asking that same question. What made that needle move? Well, there was an electric field produced by that moving magnet. And that's what we have here. It's just looking at it right now, you see that the magnetic field is going to the right. Oh, okay, maybe we should go through direction a little bit better. Ah, and, and, and colors might help here, because your, your author uses green here. Okay, so if I close this switch, and the current goes behind and around, behind and around, as the current goes this way, then this would be making a magnetic field. That direction. Okay? All right. Now, remember Faraday's law. Um, I've kind of erased it here, but I'll put it up here. So here's our Faraday's law. And here's our extension of Faraday's law today where we're going to say the change in flux is coming from the current in itself. Okay, so more on that in a second. But as I look at this, then what I would start off with is very little current or no current and it would be increasing. So the magnetic field in here would start weak and get stronger and stronger and stronger. So the induced EMF is going to be in such a direction to oppose the change. Remember, the change is more field this way. So the secondary effect is to create a field this way. Now, let me not use my left hand, but this way. And that means it would produce a voltage this way. And so the voltage would be plus here, minus there, plus there, minus there, pushing back opposite to the direction this one is, is pushing. So just thinking for every reaction, there's a reaction. <sighs> I hesitate to use those words only because those are mechanical words. No, exactly. <laughs> but I suppose it would work. Yeah, that's just the way it goes. Like water wants to evaporate. What? That doesn't make sense to me. So this opposes the change. The EMF is opposite to the change. So in this case, the flux is increasing in this way. So the secondary effect is to create a flux to oppose it. In a minute, we haven't got that far yet, but we will do the opposite. We will say, all right, you already have current flowing in here and you open the switch. What's going to happen? And we'll see again, it opposes the change, and so the EMF will be produced in the other direction so that the, it wants to keep the current flowing. So it always wants to oppose the change. If you try to put it current in, it holds it back. If you already have current going through it and you try to eliminate it, it adds back to the circuit. It always opposes the change. That's Faraday's law. And that's the concept, the idea. But what I want to do before we do the next step and we open the switch and we try to turn it off is can we get a mathematical form of this? Sure. Now remember, and, and I mean this in all sincerity, no new piece of physics here. We did the same thing when we did circuits. When we did our circuits in chapter 28, we said, look, let's just apply conservation of energy and conservation of charge. And we did Kirchhoff's laws and we did uh, 
equivalent circuits and that's about all we did. Uh, you guys in the circuits class went a step further. You did uh, mesh currents. You did volt note volt what do you say volt node voltage ones. Uh, you did even source transformations too, but all of those were based upon the physics of conservation of energy and conservation of charge. And they just kind of gave you a different way of looking at it, making particular problems a little bit easier. Same thing here. I want to say Faraday's law applied to itself is called induction. And I wanted to make sure that this first half hour, when we're past that, that you got a good conceptual feel that there is an, an EMF produced in itself within the circuit because you're changing the current within the circuit. But other than that, we could write out the equation. I mean, let's give it a shot here. Let's do this. Let's see if we can come up with the equation for this. Let's write this out. If I were to write this out, I would have three elements. One, two, three. Maybe it's better to look at this one. One, two, three. We already learned a long time ago, if you add up all the voltages around the loop, what do you get? You get zero. So let's add up a, around the loop. Maybe I will start here and I will go this direction. So the first thing I get is V. I will keep going around the loop and the next thing I get is the EMF that is produced by this new device we're talking about called the inductor. So that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about that. Then there would be a minus IR. All of that has to be zero. No, this is when I connect the battery. So as soon as I close the switch, then I've got a V here, an EMF here from the inductance, and then a voltage there. Oh, okay, fair enough. Now, how do I calculate the EMF? It is the negative of the change in, in current. And so let's define a direction for the current. And I guess I already did when I put a negative here. I think what you were asking, and it might look better if I had written it maybe this way, as negative of the magnitude of the EMF. Yeah, because it is going to be a negative in terms of opposing it. Because if the current is going this direction, or the change in current is increasing here, then the AMF is in that direction. So, think about what I put together. This is our conservation of energy. This is what we call Kirchhoff's loop rule, right? I also put in here for the first time a voltage produced from Faraday's law, an inductance. And so that's what this chapter is. Put those two things together. Put our circuits together with our Faraday's law. Could you solve this equation for current? Could you answer the question, what is the current as a function of time? Isn't that it right there? Solve this equation. So, Faraday's law, right there. Kirchhoff's law, solve for I. And so, I'll do a couple of math steps here. But as I bring the derivative to one side of the equation, maybe you can see it a little better. This is our standard differential equation where what we can do is integrate it, but we got to to make it at least easy. It's a separation of variables, so let's get all the I's with the I's and all the T's with the T's. So in this case, this is not really having any T's in it, but it is having some I's in it. So I will put this I over to here and then just get a 1 left on the other side of my equation. And when you write it this way, I hope it looks like the same thing we did for the capacitor a couple weeks ago. It looks like the same thing we did for air friction back in Physics 121. It's a first order differential equation with constant coefficients, separation of variables, integrate once. It's the easiest differential equation we can come up with, but still a differential equation. And uh, so now I can integrate with respect to time to undo this derivative. 
And of course, what's nice about that is when I do it, maybe I will integrate from zero to T, which means then on this side of the equation, the current goes from, say, zero to some value I as a function of time. So we're going to go, you know, some moment T, and so that'll be the new current it has. On this side of the equation, it's fairly easy. That's just a T. Uh, on the other side of the equation, I guess I have an L that I'll just pull out in front. Uh, that was the nice thing about taking this step earlier on. Remember we said that the EMF is really related to the change in flux. But the change in flux has to do with how many turns do you have, how much area do you have, how much length do you have, and the change in current. So all this other stuff we'll just put inside the symbol L for inductance, and the change in current we will leave separate. And so as we view our inductors, we will take all this stuff from Faraday's law and bury it into here. And so this is the L for a solenoid. And like I said, you have a homework problem to find out what is L for a toroid. You have another one that says what is L for a coaxial cable. And so you're going to find those individual values. But this leaving it as an L kind of made it nice not to have to worry about all that stuff L is made out of. Then when I have the integral, I get a V over I R, natural log. Um, there should be a chain rule here. Is this on? Should be negative R, is that right? Um, chain rule would put a negative R, yeah. Okay. Evaluated from zero to some current later in, in time. And so again, working along here, and since I want to pull down the screen here in a moment, let me jump over to here and say, all right, what then is the final answer here of closing this, this switch? And so I'm going to put my minus R L T there. Uh, then I will put in my natural log of V minus I as a function of time, R, minus, and will it be okay if I just divide since the subtraction of two logarithms is a quotient? So how about if I write it like that? Um, and then when I divide by zero current, I get the natural log of just V. Um, if I then get rid of the natural log by doing an anti-log, I get that. If I keep solving this and put the VE to the minus RLT over there, um, and then I get a V minus an I as a function of time multiplied by R. Then I get I as a function of time, R, equals a V one minus E to the minus R L T. Finally, I get what I was claiming we could solve for, and that is the current as a function of time. And that answers your question earlier, Daniel, about what shape does that function have? It is exponential, yeah. How do you get a V on the bottom? Oh, um, well, when I evaluate from zero to I here, this is really natural log of V minus I R minus the natural log, and when I put zero for I, I get just the V. Yeah. Okay. And I'm wondering if I should put a box around it yet. I guess I will. 
your author actually does one more step. He says, doesn't this look a lot like the capacitor that was charging up? And totally the same. And, but instead of charging up and making an electric field like we did with the capacitor, you might say we're charging up the inductor and we are creating a magnetic field. And so oftentimes we like to stay away from the word charging because we're not really charging in terms of charges are not on the inductor like they are on the capacitor. So I think a better word is we're energizing the inductor. But whatever word you want to put there, it looks a lot like the capacitor. The capacitor we charged up and created in an electric field. Here we are energizing up the inductor and creating a magnetic field. Of course there are a couple things that are very different because this is the current in the circuit. When we did a capacitor, that was the charge on the capacitor. And so we had our 1 minus E to the TRC. Um, and uh, CV was over there, if you remember that one. And so what's very different here is for a capacitor that we charged up. The charge followed that same equation. What was the current at the long period of time? Zero. This, what's the current after a long period of time? Yeah, it's just V over R. It's not zero. So I've kind of erased the circuit that this goes to, but in this guy here with our switch and our inductor and our resistor, what we have then after a long period of time, it's as if the inductor is not there anymore. Because remember, you only get voltage from the inductor when there's a change in current. So if you've hooked this up for a long period of time, the, the currents have settled down to some constant value and you can just think of this inductor as a short circuit, a wire without any resistor and no voltage because it's not inducing any voltage. The capacitor was not that way. What would we have to think about the capacitor after a long period of time? An open circuit, right? The charge would build up and no more current would be flowing. And so again, there's a lot of similarities between the inductor and capacitor, but they're, they're the reverses of each other. And so as you asked, huh? Actually, they're the opposite. The capacitor starts with a closed circuit, the inductor starts with an open Yes, yes, yes. So, and I'll just repeat that. Here, here, if you remember, there was no electric field when you first closed it. And it took a while for the electric field to build up. So when you first close it, you treated it as a, a closed circuit, <coughs> a short circuit, and then after a long period of time, you treated it as an open circuit. Whereas the inductor, when you first close the switch, is when you get a huge electric field. Because you get the electric field based on the rate at which the magnetic field is changing. So you don't have a magnetic field yet, but you have a quickly changing magnetic field, which gives you a huge electric field. And so you get an electric field right away. And so it starts off as an open circuit. And after a long period of time, ends up being a closed circuit. So they're exactly opposites. Both your circuits have resistors in them. Could you run through what would happen if you didn't have the resistors? Well, uh, sure. I mean, in both cases, um, you could kind of put it in this equation and say, well, what if R is equal to zero? But I'll start with you can never have R equal to zero. Because if you did not put a resistor in the circuit, you always have wires that have some resistance. So if you put a resistor in there and it has 100 ohms, then your wires are small to that and we ignore the wires. However, if you don't put a resistor in there, then you say the resistance is all from the wires themselves. And so you'll get like a hundredth of an ohm depending on how long your, you know, your wires are. So you can't ever have a 
situation where you have no resistance. But we can get closer and closer. And I'll show you that here like I did with the capacitor. I'll, I'll go back to the capacitor. With the capacitor, when we plotted charge per time, we said it looked something like that. And then we said, well, what happens if you lowered this number? We referred to this, if you remember, as its time constant. And if the R got smaller, or if the capacitance got smaller, but your question is about R, if R got smaller and smaller and smaller, what that essentially meant is the time constant was smaller. Which really just meant this could charge up much quicker. And so it began to look like this. And if the R got smaller, it would even look like that. And you could never get infinitely small, but in an ideal world where you say it could, you would do like that. Because in that case, the capacitor would instantly charge, and then the current would instantly stop, and the charge would reach its full, and so it would go that. So lowering the resistor makes it look more and more what we would call a step function. We're going to do the same thing here. We are going to call tau the time constant. We're going to write it as an L over R so that we can write the current as a function of time as equaling V over R 1 minus E to the minus T over tau again. And so it looks a lot the same. And so probably the easiest way to kind of explain this chapter from here forward is that, hey, everything we did for the capacitor or we're just doing with the inductor. And so all that wonderful stuff, just apply it. They're the reverses of each other. One's talking about the charge, and one's talking about the current. But they do have a time constant. They do reach a peak or a maximum. In this case, the current reaches a maximum, whereas over here, the charge reached a, uh, a maximum. Uh, there is, of course, this little subtlety here that I got to admit always makes me do a double take here because I, 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 you know, this one we learned first, the R and the C go together. If you, in this case, if you were to decrease R, it would look something like that. So if you were to plot this one here and you say, what does the current look like in a small moment of time? Then you would say, all right, here is the current in a small moment of time. There's no current. And then it will increase up following this natural exponent up to its maximum. And then if you lower the inductance or if you raise the resistance, it looks like that and like that and to finish your question if there was no resistance <laughs> it'd be a little bit more like that or did I say that backwards wait that would be lowering the inductance and raising the resistance sorry um, so I guess the opposite is true. If you had no resistance here, well, e to the zero would always be one minus one, and you would, I guess, that's kind of weird looking, but more, less and less resistance would essentially mean my maximum current is going to be higher and higher and higher. So it would go higher, but because the change would be so much, the voltage or the slope of it would be way down. Well, I thought, oh, I think I saw a question that I was... And so I thought it would be good to see this. And so, turning on the display here, let's look at our equipment again. As I mentioned before, but I thought this would be a good addition to our lab we did last week. Remember the oscilloscope? And so the oscilloscope, what does it measure on the vertical axis? Volt. Horizontal? Time. Okay. And so I have my oscilloscope here 
Let me clean things up a little bit. And so there is my scale. Each division is worth two volts. Each time division is a hundred microseconds. Now when I was playing with this this morning, it all happened within about time frames of a millionth of a second. So let me change the time frame so that each horizontal division is one microsecond. But let me hook this up. Let me hook up this circuit right here. A switch, six volt inductor, resistor. All right, so I will start with right here. Here is my six volt power supply. Okay, looking at that circuit, it goes to a switch. All right, this will be my switch. All right, so I'll leave that one alone. From the switch, it goes to my inductor. All right, so there is the first set of turns of my inductor. And after going through my inductor, it will then go to my resistor. Now maybe you guys remember these from the lab. It's been a little while since we've used them. They'll be back real soon here. But you can change the resistance in here by changing the dial. Let me set it at 100 ohms. And so I will feed it here and I will feed it here. Pardon me? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Let's try that. But let's just set up the air core first. All right. And so there is my circuit. And so I claim that when I close this switch, the circuit will start building up current and get to its maximum. Okay? Now, in order for me to see that, I guess I have to hook up the scope. So the next step is to say, Let's hook up the scope. Now, the scope, if you remember, it's a little experimental trick here. It only measures voltage. It doesn't measure current. Bummer. Ah, but fortunately, there is a nice relationship between voltage, current, and resistance when I look at the resistor. So, what I'm going to do is look at the voltage on the resistor. Fair enough. It will be related to the current. It won't be exactly the current. If I wanted the current on the resistor, I need to take the voltage that I'm about to measure and divide it by my resistance. Okay? And so if I really want no current, I could. But we'll see the same shape, and that's all we're after here. So let me take my channel one here and connect to my resistor here. All right, so now I think I'm ready to see it. I will tell you, though, it happens really, really quick, so I got to do a little fancy adjustments on this scope. This one's a little more sophisticated than the one you guys saw in class here. But right here, then, is my what we call the trigger spot. You might even see up there, it says it's waiting for trigger. Uh, here's what it's really waiting for. It's just kind of standing back and analyzing the data but not displaying anything. It's waiting for when does the voltage change. And when the voltage gets as high as this arrow. And so I will adjust my trigger to 4 volts. So it's two divisions up. Each division worth 2 volts. And when the voltage gets to 4 volts, then it will bother to display something. So simply put, it's constantly measuring voltage and displaying nothing. But when it detects 4 volts, here's what it's going to do. It's going to display the 4 volts right here at the trigger spot. And it will display 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, million, uh, five microseconds before it got to 4 volts. And it will display one, two, three, four, five, five seconds, five microseconds after 
it got there. So it's a nice scope in the sense that it can be have the fancy triggers here. But that's what I want to see. Remember I told you it's not going to take long. This is going to rock it up in a very short time frame depending on what the value is of my resistor and my inductor. And my inductor is not very, very much. If we come back and analyze the number here, mu naught, what was that? 10 to the minus 7. I mean, yes, I have 180 turns. Even then I have a small area and I have a small length. But it's really that factor there that says I have a really, really small inductance. And so that's why this is going to take place in a short amount of time. And that's why it's a little tricky to see this. So let's give it a shot here and keep our fingers crossed. Will we see it here? And maybe we'll have to do a couple of times. Oh, that's an ugly one. And it was up. Was it upside down? Let me just check my voltage. Aha. I would like to see the other direction. Okay. All right. Try it again. One, two, three. Ah, I love that one. Okay, good. All right. So there is the display at four volts and everything before, or at least five microseconds before and five microseconds after. And I hope it looks a lot like this equation that A, we just derived and B, we are experimenting with. Yeah? If it happens so fast, why does it even matter? Why do you even do that? Many times it doesn't matter. But what if this current was going on and off? Every millionth of a second. See, it would never build up. So, yeah, if you're, uh, if this is an electric motor, and I go to turn on my vacuum cleaner and it, yes, it takes five millionth of a second to go, who, who cares? I don't, for the vacuum cleaner. Although I must say the vacuum cleaner is going to have a lot more coils and it's going to take more, a lot more time than this. I have a very small inductor. In fact, that's what I want you to see. It was your guys' question that what if I change the inductance? What if I change the resistance? What, what, would, it, what would that look like? Yeah. Fair enough. Ah. ah, I like your thinking. I like your design. Yeah, that's a good engineering thinking and saying, what could I do to stop this? Uh, as far as I know, no, it just let them burn out. So what? It's not worth the, you know, they're, 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 they're that close. Yeah, 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 they're, they're that close. So as far as I know, no, but I will say there is a lot, a lot of times where getting a lot of burst current is a problem and the equipment is sensitive. So they will put inductors in the circuit while things are being turned on, on things like satellites and uh, the space shuttle and the International Space Station and things where, you know, money is not the main issue. It is, you know, what happens if the thing fries the board and it's out in, in space or something real complicated. Yeah. Oh, well, you, and, and I got kind of lucky here. I got it to work on the second try, and the first one was off only because I had the wires reversed. But w remember, when I try to put two wires together, there's a lot of this going on. And so there's all kinds of voltages created by uh, contact. So I tried to shove it real quick here. Okay. And... Uh, and then this is just a, probably a little bit of that rubbing. The rest of this is probably noise picked up by the electronics for the rest of my circuits there. All right, let me save this one. So I'm going to put it and save that one into what we call channel one. Okay, and I'm going to leave it on the, the screen here. And I'll leave channel one there. Let's go back to and clear channel one. Oh, let me disconnect it. Okay, so what I have is I now have stored in memory what we just saw. Now I have channel one with nothing hooked up. What would happen if I change the resistance? I change it from 100 to 200. What would increasing the R do? 
Increasing the R. What does it do to the time constant? <coughs> Decreases it. Meaning what? Yeah, it's going to take less time to build up, right? We've got a lower time constant. And so when I do this yet again, hopefully, I will see the same general behavior, but a different rate at which it increases. Ah, there it is. And it doesn't start in the same place here, but it's supposed to match at the trigger. That's how the thing is calibrated to record data from the same trigger spot. But you can see, isn't that increasing up? Isn't it increasing to the same maximum current? Didn't it do it at a little faster rate? Let me save that one also and clear and disconnect. And do it one more time. One more click. So now I'm at 300 ohms. What would you expect to see at 300? Yeah, a even quicker one. And so sure enough, there it is. Even a quicker one. Uh, what? Now you mean the rate at which the current, um, right? Because right there we're measuring voltage. You said. Yeah. Now I got to admit, this this picture here can be a little misleading. Oh, thank you. And I even said it wrong because it goes up to the same voltage. It doesn't go up to the same maximum current. Thank you. I think that is that what you're trying to say. See, V over R. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I take the credit for it. Yeah, I, I, I misspoke there. It, w w when it goes up, I, I was focused on the rate at which it is going up. But another consequence of this is it won't go up to as much current because V over R is the maximum current. And you don't see that on my display because my display is not really measuring current. It's measuring the voltage and so yes I get less current but I also got high more voltage so you end up seeing the same voltage each time as it should good and it should go up to the six volts because eventually as we talked about eventually this can be thought of as a short circuit and all we have then is six volts on the resistor from our six volt power supply so I think you can see it catering on up to six volts or at least near six volts in fact, maybe I should point out, it's kind of neat to see that it is a little less than 6 volts. That's because this actually has some resistance too. So we don't have a full 6 volts on this resistor. We've got almost 6 and then we got resistance in this one here. Now I can get to yours, Danny. Let's go the other way around. What if I change the inductor instead of the resistance? So let's do this. Let's, let's clear all this stuff off of here. Uh, memory one, memory two, um, channel one. Oh, whoops, wrong button. Uh, okay, and so there's channel one. Let me set the dial back to 100. Um, let's look at that one yet again. And so if I shove that together for my switch, I save that, good, and go back to channel one, then this is the rate of increase when we have the inductor I have, which is 180 turns, and the resistor, which is set at 100. Let me change the inductance, yeah. Yes, oh well, good. And I hope you do because, again, how could I change the effect of this inductor? How could I say increase it or decrease it? 
Well, maybe it's worth looking at the equation we derived an hour ago. Remember, the inductance comes from Faraday's law. And it, anything that a cha affects the change in flux is going to change the inductance. Probably the easiest one to see is the number of turns. What if I were to change the number of turns? And so for my inductor, that's pretty easy because this inductor has 180 when you go from that connection to the end. But if you go only part way, like here, it says, well, it says 40% of 180. So whatever the heck that is here. I guess we could figure that out. But it's, uh, now I'm curious. What's, what's 40? 72? Is that? All right. But so now... I'm at 40% the number of turns. Now, it's n squared, so it would be 40% squared, which 0.4 squared is, what, 16%? So I should have changed the inductance by, by 16, or down to 16% of what it, what it started. But not, again, not worrying about the numbers, I should have a different inductance. And we'll show you that one, but we'll also show you the core. But before I pull the screen back down, the core you mentioned is not so obvious in this because how did we treat our solenoid? What's that? It's not just a constant. What's the name of it? Permeability of free space. This is how much flux you get in free space. This is for an air coil. This number would be different if it had some kind of magnetic material. So to answer your question, Danny, is if I were to put an iron core in there, this number would change and could change substantially. This actually is a thousand times more than that one. And so I wasn't prepared to put in the core, but hey, as long as you're asking, I'll give it a try. But I was prepared to change the number of turns. So let's take a look at that. If I come over here and notice then I have decreased the inductance. So again, let's come over here. If I decrease the inductance, where is it? What does that do to the time constant? It decreases it. So decreasing the inductance was a lot like me increasing the resistance. So I guess I'm kind of expecting the same effect that I saw last time and that is I should see it climb at a faster rate here. And then, so hooking up my equipment again and watching it, I will see something with a much lower inductance as it tapers up. If, on the other hand, I go back to the 180 turns and throw in some magnetic material, That should make the inductance higher. And also might add more complexity to the circuit. So we'll see how clean this gets. But I'm hoping we will get higher inductance. And what should higher inductance look like? Yeah, higher inductance should be a bigger time constant taking a much longer time to build up to its charge. Yeah. Uh, let me not change it unless I need to. I'll be curious to leave it on the time, same time scale so I can compare it. But you're, you're right. It may take so long that on this time scale might not be good to, to view it. But the nice thing about it is I have the trigger right here. So it should trigger here. And if it just takes a long time, then I just won't see the beginning part of it. But I'm hoping, I don't think it'll be that long. I think, we'll, I think we'll be able to see it back here. I'm guessing. I don't know. I don't know how much inductance we have. I said a thousand times, but it's not going to pick up all of that. They, those magnetic uh, iron pieces don't flip that fast. So it's not truly a thousand times more. But let's see, nonetheless. Oh, I lost it. I wanted to save that one. All right, you remember what that one looked like. <laughs> Should I go back? Yeah, yeah, let's take the core out, change it. Let's grab that one again. Oh, guess I gotta reset it. Okay, let's grab that one again. Okay, oops, other than a little slip there. 
Um, I have that. Okay, so let's go to reference number two. Let's save that one. Okay, now let's go back to 180. Let's put the core in here. All right, let's get ready for one with a higher inductance. Which one was it? Is it is it this one? Yeah. So it is a hair more, but nothing to be excited about. Yeah. I'm gonna try that one again because I, I just think it, I would have thought it would be a lot more than that. Huh. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I still, with the core, I would have expected it a lot more than that. I'm disappointed in that. But this should probably have a larger inductance. Let's try that one. Okay. Oh. Yeah, this one might not have a clean winding to it. Okay, I don't think this is going to work well for an inductor. It's no terrible windings. Maybe I'll try half the windings. But uh, I do remember having this trouble before one year that that works terrible as an inductor. So no, don't look at that one. Now I'm all right. So, I won't. Okay, at the inductor. Oh, they, the, it's, there still is some inductance. So, don't get me wrong. It is acting as an inductor. I'm not seeing it really well because they've wound it and then they kind of cross their wires and wound it back on top of each other. So, it goes one way and then another way. And I'm not real sure why they did it. That's why I was thinking the f half the turns, because they did half the turns this way. Then they crossed it back on top of each other and went back the other way. So I was, yeah, I've always had troubles with this one. And th that's my speculation. I guess I really don't know. But I've never been able to get it as work as cleanly as this guy here. Just, just haven't been able to, to pick it up. Oh well, anyways, maybe I spent too much time there, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that we have done what we affectionately refer to here as an RL circuit. And I think you can see why we use the word R and L. The R for the resistance and the L for the inductance. And so we have a nice little circuit then that seems to build up a current and then reach a maximum. Let's look at this picture here for a moment. What if I bring up a diagram out of your book here, 32, and let me switch over to yours and say, hey, let, let's take a look at this circuit. And a slightly different looking switch than you are perhaps used to seeing. But let's take a close look at it. When the switch is this way, which we'll call A, isn't that what we just studied for this last hour and a half? Isn't this the voltage and then it goes through the switch and then it goes through the inductor and then it goes through the resistor? Fair enough? And if you left it on position A for a long period of time, wouldn't the current build up to this V over R? Okay. Then, what happens when you move the switch from A and instantly to B? That's kind of what this metal thing is trying to do here in this connecting. And so, as you move the switch from A, it's still connected, still connected, still connected, still connected. And this is more of an ideal setting, so I'm not going to try to show you this. 
But what happens if I could go from instantly touching the power supply to instantly not connected to the power supply? See what happens when it's down here in B? What's down here in B? Nothing. There's no power supply. Is there any current? Right. So what happened is we had energized the inductor before we made the close. And so when we make the close here, let's talk about that one. And this, I hope you're seeing, is a lot like the capacitor. What happened after we charged the capacitor up? And then we disconnected the capacitor from the power supply and then we brought it over to a resistor. Was there any current? Yeah, because the energy, if you will, the current is coming from the charges stored on the capacitor. Well, the same thing is going to happen here with this inductor. If you have the circuit they're showing here, here's your resistor, here is your inductor. And Oh, maybe I should pause there. I put it once on, up on the, uh, on the board there, but I meant to say the symbol for the inductor is this kind of squirrely thing here that looks kind of like a solenoid. Now it could be any kind of wires twisted around so it could be a toroid also or it could be a coaxial cable as I mentioned you are going to have to solve on your homework but the symbol is still the same where we take a little curly crew. It's the simplest one. We did the same thing with capacitors if you remember. We put two parallel plates. Not to say that every capacitor is literally a parallel plate but the easiest one was and so the symbol we use is the parallel plate. Same thing here. Not every inductor is a solenoid in shape but it's a, n a nice one to draw. So that's the symbol we will use. Alright, so there's my resistor, there's my inductor and essentially at this moment I have just that. Do I have any current? <laughs> and if so, where would it come from? I mean, where is the EMF, where is the voltage that is producing the current? The answer? The Faraday's law, right? Faraday's law says there is an EMF produced if there is a change in flux and the change in flux would come from the change in current. So when you try to go from being connected to the power supply to being disconnected from the power supply, you might say you're trying to change the current from some peak value to some zero value. Isn't that a change? And that change then will make this an EMF. And so I could label this as a plus and a minus. If it helps like we did an hour ago, I can think of this as this now is my power supply. And so what I'm trying to say here is that don't forget to think of Faraday's law, we have our voltages that are created from our charges, our batteries. But we also have our voltages that are produced by a changing magnetic field. And so as this connects to B, I would claim that the current is trying to go down. And Faraday's law says an EMF will be produced to oppose the change to keep it from going down. And it will go down, but it won't go down right away. It will take some time and some effort to decay away. And so just like our capacitor, when you short circuit that capacitor, after you charge it up, you could hook it to a resistor and it will have current for a while. Same thing here. You short circuit this inductor, you are going to get current for a while. There is going to be an EMF. And we need to look at the direction of that EMF. Let's go through Faraday's law. Um, because there are really no charges being like, contained on the L value, does it take less time for it to de-energize than it takes time for the capacitor to destroy? Oh, well, the... Uh, the value for a capacitor to charge and discharge was related to R and C. 
the rate at which it took for the inductor to energize, and maybe I should leave it up here, was this time constant a little different. It had an L and an R in it, in a different order. So I'm not sure I can really compare a capacitor to a inductor, because I could have a very large inductor, and that would take a long time to build up the current, as opposed to a small capacitor would charge up right away. So, I mean, I can't say capacitor to inductor unless I also say how big is the capacitor and what resistor is it hooked to. Then I can begin to ask how does the time constant for the RC circuit compare to the time constant for the LR circuit. Right, so I need both of those. Yeah. All right. Now, um, coming back to this Faraday's law, let's take a close look at this conceptually before we get into the math here. Remember the current was already going like this. No, sorry. Oh, shoot. So, sorry. This is, okay, and this picture is opposite of what I was drawing uh, uh, earlier on. My, my inductor had the current going that way, which is why I put plus minus. So I apologize there. It wants to do that, plus minus. It wants to keep the current going in the same direction it was already going before we moved the switch. All right, so, because in the one I was doing, you know, getting started with, I had my battery down here, so they put the battery on the other side. All right, so I just want to make sure that was clear, but what I would have before I moved the switch to B is I would have current going that way. And so as I move it this way, what's going to happen is the current is going to want to decrease. But it opposes the change, exactly. So again, if we go through Faraday's law here, you would have a magnetic field in here. And that magnetic field would be getting weaker because we are decaying the current away. So the secondary effect is to create an EMF to add to that current. And so essentially, at this point, the current is all coming from the EMF produced by the inductor. There is no more battery connected anymore. But we can certainly go through the same type of logic that we did for energizing the inductor, as in this case, de-energizing the inductor. The differential equation is going to be even easier to solve, just like it was when we discharged the capacitor. It was easier than we charged the capacitor. Although conceptually, I think it may, it's easier to understand charging things up or energizing them up. So I always start there. But the differential equation on the de-energizing or discharging the capacitor is a lot easier here. So let's work this out. If I were to let the current go in this way, then as I added up the voltage around the loop, maybe I will start here and go that direction, I would first get the minus L D I D T. There's the equation, if you will, for the uh, voltage on the inductor. Then as it goes through the resistor, it's minus I R, that has to equal to zero. So again, I want to emphasize, because this is the whole chapter, Faraday's Law together with Kirchhoff's Law. And so we're just going to put our inductor in the circuit, write out the equations and solve, and see what usefulness we get out of all of this and why we would care about it. But if I go to solve this for I, it actually becomes a much easier differential equation, although it's still first order and it still is separation of variables and it still is constant coefficients. But I will get one that have less terms in it. And I'll put the L on the other side. Um, in fact, give myself some room to work with here. I will then get a minus 1 over I D I D T for separating the I's over to there. 
And then maybe I'll put the negative over here, R over L. And go on, what do you mean, where is it flowing to? What? Yeah, so what's going to happen is the EMF is going to be produced this direction to keep it flowing. So I would say before you move the switch from A to B, the current was going in this middle part here. It was going from the right over here to the left, then through the battery and around. As soon as you move the switch down, what's going to happen now is it's going to go same direction in here, but now it's going to arc around and go this way, around, around B. And of course, I just need to now solve this equation. So I will integrate both sides with respect to time, like we did an hour ago. I will go from zero to T here. I will go from zero to some current as a function of time here. This then becomes ln of Oh, my bad. It's not zero. Um, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's whatever it starts at. What do you want to call it? How about I naught? I naught. Now, we learned earlier that I naught, if this was closed for a long period of time. So I just want to say I naught just in case it wasn't closed for a long period of time. But if it was closed for a long period of time, we learned that the current would be the EMF here divided by the resistance. That's eventually what it would be built up to. But if we only left it closed for a fraction of a second and then moved it over, it wouldn't be that high. But it would be some value. And so that's why I probably should write it as an I naught to some maximum value. So I naught to some, oh and I shouldn't say maximum, now it's going down, so to some minimum value. But the current as a, a function of, of time depending on how much time I've left it closed. So that would be that side of the equation. This side of the equation would just come out to be there. And uh, so what I can get is the ln of the current as a function of time divided by its initial equals e to the minus r over lt i t over i naught equals e to the minus r over t. And then finally I can get what I want you to see here and that is an equation for the current and so we can solve the equation. And so we would have a starting current and it would decay and I guess you could argue it never gets to zero but you're getting too mathematical to be useful at that point. <laughs> ah, don't tell the math professors I said that. But <laughs> I mean it's like saying you know I, I, all I have is a penny. Do you, do you have no money? I think the scientist and engineer will say you have no money. <laughs> but I think the mathematician says, no, you got a penny. How can that be no money? Well, what can I do with it? Absolutely nothing. So you have no money. No, you have a penny. <laughs> oh. oh, I forgot something here? You put the E on the right side. Okay. So. Yeah, yeah, I went, yeah, I went too far. Okay, so, so now raise it to a power of E, I get that, and then I get that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Would this kind of be the same thing as discharging? Yeah, so you would say I am de-energizing it as opposed to discharging it because, again, there's not charges involved, so we like to stay away from that word, but if you say it, I, I understand what you're saying. This is like discharging a capacitor. We are now de-energizing our inductor. We're losing the electric field. We are, I mean, excuse me, we're losing the magnetic field. And in the process of losing the magnetic field, I should point out again, 
The magnetic field is changing, that induces an EMF and that's what Faraday's law is and that's where the voltage comes from and that's why you get current flowing even as it decays away here. So we have the part where we energize the inductor and we have the part where we disenergize or de-energize the inductor. And we saw the same thing for the capacitor. And that's, I don't know if this was part of your question, I know you asked it when we got to capacitors. Does the charging up of the capacitor and the discharging of the capacitor follow the same rate? And we did does. It follows the RC time constant. And so we can say the same thing now for the inductor. Does the rate at which the inductor energize equal the rate at which it de-energizes? Assuming you haven't changed anything. Yes, it does. And it is that L over R is the time constant. And so the inductance and the resistance together give me the rate at which it de-energizes. And so a lot, again, look like the capacitor here. Alright. Let's talk about the energy now. Now that you guys asked some good questions about the current building up, let's look at the, the energy here. In fact, let's, let's analyze it this way. Your author says, imagine this switch back at A. So now that we looked at when the switch was at A, and then moved the switch over to B, and we have an equation for the current when it is energizing and the current when it is de-energizing. Let's ask this question about the energy. In fact, I'll draw that circuit over here. So here is the battery. And let me ask you this question. I like to use V for the voltage of the battery so that I can kind of say my script E for the induced voltage and so that maybe we don't confuse the voltage you're getting from the battery with the voltage you are getting from the inductor which changes with time. So we'll be okay if I repeat the same circuit but put a V instead of an E here. Alright. So as this thing is building up you would probably say right now there is an EMF being produced by Faraday's law there. All right. So let's go back to energizing it. And if you remember the equation that we solved about an hour ago, it was this. We said, let's go around the loop and write out the equation. So we had V minus L D I D T minus I R equals zero. And that's what the equation was. And of course it was a differential equation and we solved for I. Fair enough. Let's look at it a little differently here. Let's multiply everything by I and get rid of the negatives. So I'll first multiply everything by I. Current. I'll then get rid of all the negative signs and let's study this. I think it's been a while since I said it for this class. Let's read the math instead of just do the math. What, what does this mean to you? Yeah, good. What, let's start with the V times I. What is that telling you? Right there. Power. What, what, what power? Okay, this is the power coming from the battery. That's why I wanted to use the V here. This is the V for the battery times the current in the battery. Now it's just a series circuit so all the current's the same everywhere. But when you take the voltage in the battery times the current in the battery, you get the power coming from the battery. This is the rate at which energy is coming from the battery. And where is it going? To two terms. Let's look at the easy one. What's this one? This is the power being consumed by the resistor. This is the rate at which the resistor is getting hot, if you will. And so it kind of makes sense that if energy is coming from the battery, it must be going, some anyways, to the resistor. So what's that term? Yeah, that's the power 
that is going to the inductor. That's what I want to focus on. And so the rate at which we are adding energy to our inductor is the L I D I D T. That is the rate that energy goes to our inductor. So if I write this as P sub L, the rate at which energy, power, is going to my inductor, that would be L I D I dt. Fair enough? And if I remember that power is the rate at which energy is going to my inductor and I write that phrase mathematically as a differential, then I have an equation that has energy in my inductor. And to use the same notation that your author uses, he uses a capital U sub B. Now the sub B might throw you off till we keep going, but the sub B stands for, this is the energy in the inductor, and the energy in the inductor, as we'll see for a moment, is in the magnetic field. And so didn't we have the capacitor, and the energy was stored in the capacitor, and it was stored in the electric field? I mean, maybe it's worth coming back over here to our capacitor and say, didn't we have a U sub E? Didn't we say that the capacitor stored energy? And what was the equation that we had? Do you remember? I, yeah, with the final only, what, four weeks away, I'm sure you've been reviewing, getting ready for the final exam. But in case you've forgotten, it's one-half CV squared. That is the energy stored in our capacitor. And if you also remember from back then, what we did is we said you could think of the energy stored in this capacitor as being made up of its energy density times its volume. Do you remember that? And the energy density, if you recall, was one half epsilon naught E squared. Yes, no. And uh, granted, we didn't do much with it. Ah, but we are now going to for the next couple of chapters. And so this is a good time to review that we said, look, the energy in a capacitor is one half CV squared. And we argued then that that energy would be inside between the two plates. And we looked at the volume and we said that this would be the energy density. The density times the volume gave us that electric field. I'd like to do the same thing again, but now with the inductor. I would like to get the equation for the energy stored in the inductor. I would like to convince you that this is energy stored in the field, the magnetic field. So we can have energy stored in an electric field and we can have energy stored in a magnetic field. And so for those of you who maybe were asking this question, that after we move the switch from A to B over here, and the current continued, that should have brought up two questions. The first question was, well, where does the voltage come from to continue the current after you moved it from A to B? Well, hopefully I answered that one. That one was easy. That one, well, Faraday's law. The voltage comes from, because when you move it from A to B, you're trying to decrease the current. If you decrease the current, you change the flux in here, you change the flux, you're going to produce an EMF. All right. But the second part of that was, where does the energy come from? Because when current is flowing through here, and granted it might have only be five microseconds, but, but when current is flowing through there, doesn't that produce heat in this resistor? And where does that energy come from? The energy that's stored in the inductor. And where does the inductor store its energy? in the magnetic field and that's what I want to convince you of here and so just like the capacitor that the capacitor would continue to give us current as it was discharging because we would get a voltage from the charges that build up we would say the energy then comes from the electric field that was inside the capacitor we can say the same thing with this inductor this inductor is going to continue to have current because it's going to get a voltage from Faraday's law 
The energy it gets is stored in the magnetic field. And we should have a set of equations that look very similar to what we did for the electric field. <coughs> yeah. So wait, doesn't, don't, doesn't the electric magnetic field like decay very fast because if there is very like, wouldn't it decay very fast? No, uh, no, fast or slow is all related to how big is your inductor and how small is your resistor. And so this could be you know, I, the ones I've been showing you are simple ones here, a fraction of a second. But this could be, you know, minutes to build up if it's a sh truly a huge inductor. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, in general, if you wanted something to take a long time to build up, it's usually pretty easy to do it with capacitors. A little more, char a little more challenging with inductors. But as you'll see in the next couple of chapters, we'll put the inductors and capacitors and have them work together. And the fun part's going to begin when we start putting them together. And then we will have inductors, capacitors, resistors, switches, voltages, all together. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. And so... As we are coming to the end of time, let me do this integral. And you can see that they're both with respect to time. And so when you cross out time, you will get what we're after. What is the equation for the energy stored in the inductor? Just like we did back here for the capacitor. We get what? And so there is our equation for the in energy in the inductor. What does it depend on? Well, it depends on what is the value of the inductor and how much current you have. But wasn't that just like the capacitor? The energy stored in the capacitor depended on what? How much capacitance and the voltage you applied to it to charge it up. And so this is energizing it up and we energize it up to a current. And that is my inductor. And then, maybe this would be a good time to turn this off altogether. If we make the step back to here, this is the equation for the inductance. Now it's only good for a solenoid, so I'll, I'll prove it to you only for a solenoid, but as we'll see soon it works not just for a solenoid or toroid. But let me do it first with a, a uh, solenoid here. If I write this as the inductance, which is mu naught times n squared times area over L and then I squared and if I also remember that the magnetic field in a solenoid is related to the current I can then replace current with magnetic field squared divided by mu naught. And instead of writing a little n, I'll write a capital N over L. And that's all squared. Uh, wait. Yeah, those are all squared. If I then do a little bit of arrangement I will get a one half and a mu naught there. I will get a b squared there. The number of turns will cancel off. One of the l's will cancel off and I will end up with area times length. What is area times length? So this is volume. So what must this be? Yeah, that must be the energy density, right? If you think about bringing the volume over to here, you would have energy per volume equaling one-half B squared mu naught. And that is what we are going to put as a small mu sub B 
just like we did for the electric field although again I remember doing it at the end of one lecture really quick saying look this is the energy density we won't really use it till we get to the end of the semester so now we're here and so what we have said is this is the energy per volume stored in an electric field and this over here then is the energy density uh, yeah mu actually uh, I guess small u b now that I think about it yeah your author uses small so he uses he uses capital U for the total energy in the magnetic field he uses a little u yeah I, I was thinking that too but it's not and I, I was same thing over here he uses a little u sub e to say this is the energy density in here yeah. but that's what I wanted you to see all right now this is probably a good stopping point with one more exception here let's look again a little closer at this equation so I hope I got across to you the 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 idea of the inductor I mean if I were to sum summarize these next two hours I hope you will catch I didn't do anything new I put together a lot of stuff that we already knew particularly our circuits and Kirchhoff's loop law together with the Faraday's law and we said what happens if you had an inductor is what we will now call it but what if we had a solenoid in our circuit there would be what we would refer to as an electromagnetic effect the current makes a magnetic field but that current is changing so the magnetic field is changing that changing magnetic field produces a secondary electric field so not only do you have an EMF from the battery that's in the circuit but you get an EMF from the Faraday's part of it that's what I was trying to say and I had never even mentioned what are the units for our inductor and so to finish up here let's study this equation yet again let's come back to here and as we study this equation to get the current both energizing and de-energizing and then we studied the current of uh, the uh, e the uh, equation to get the energy let's finish here by saying if this is going to be our working equation for the voltage produced by an inductor let's rearrange this and see if this helps if I write this as L equals what and I'll tell you this helps me a lot what does that equation tell me what does L when written in this fashion say yeah this tells me that if I were to tell you the inductance is say 5 what do you mean by that it means I get 5 volts when the current is changing at a rate of 1 amp every second now again just like we said the capacitance was 10 microfarads we didn't necessarily meant you had 10 microcoulombs of charge what it meant is you got 10 microcoulombs of charge for every volt I'm not saying when you say the inductance is 5 that you're going to get 5 volts what I'm saying is you're going to get 5 volts of back EMF when the current is changing at a rate of 1 amp every second and if it was changing at a faster than that then I would put a 5 here and some other number maybe a 7 or an 8 so if it was changing at a rate of a hundred amps every second then 5 times a hundred amps every second would give me 500 volts and that would be my induced EMF so the units to measure inductance would be volts per amp each second and 
quite honestly, I like it written that way. It gives me a lot of insight into what is the meaning of it. But I think some of you, especially you guys in circuits, probably already took the next step. You always tend to name these in honor of the great scientists working in the field. We did that for Newton. We did that for Joule. We did that for Watt. We did that for, for, so what do we call this? Henry's. And so the symbol is an H. And so what we will say is we will say things like our inductor has five Henry's. Now remember, magnetic fields that big would be a big number. So you'll see when we work in lab, we'll have inductors like one micro Henry, two micro Henry. So a full Henry is a huge inductor. In fact, when they start getting that big, we start calling them chokes because they choke the current. They're so big, you can't make the current increase or decrease. And so they just don't change by much. So another word we like to use is chokes. All right, well, good luck.